The following is a conversation with Luis Riff, an architect who writes, sketches, and teaches. He understands the city as a place to coexist and brings his sketchbook everywhere he goes to explore and understand the city. I uh, invited you, Luis, because I admire the work that you do and the passion that you put into everything you do. Hi, Nono. Thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I'd love to start the conversation by asking you what you try to convey with your work. It's a good question because I wouldn't say that I try to convey anything in particular. It's more a path to understand things, to see the world around me and understanding it. I am here with the Spanish poet Rafael Alberti, who wrote these beautiful lines and also accurate lines describing what is drawing, where he said that drawing is like dancing geometry, that things they missed out. This is a beautiful metaphor that really expresses the feeling of drawing. When you perceive things as blurry, if you draw them, they become crystal clear. It's like exploring. And that's what really means to me. If I'm not understanding wrong, this reminds me of that exercise that you try to do when you think that you understand something. And I believe there's a disconnect from the concept itself and understanding the actual thing. This is an exercise that you, or an effort that you have to put. It might be that you're writing or you're sketching and you're trying to portray something. And into that process, you go from the loose idea that is in your mind about a building, a space or a concept and actually having to define it, to add detail, to be specific in a way that will help you explain it to others and also explain it to yourself. Your question just reminded me of this study that has been carried out in an American university, I cannot remember which one, that proves that students that take down their notes by handwriting are more successful in understanding things than those that type in their laptops. And apparently that's because you type faster, so you can take everything down, not missing a single word. If you write them down by hand, you are slower. But what apparently is a con and not a pro is better for understanding because you have to process things. You have to understand them before taking down because you have to select what you don't have to do if you type. So I think it has something to do also with the process of learning, of sketching, of drawing from reality, because you have to understand things before taking them down. Apparently, people tend to think, mainly people that don't draw, that it's a very direct process. You see things and your brain sends an order to your hand and then you process things and you draw. But I think it's not the way things are, really. You start to make marks and the hand goes forward and the brain goes afterwards selecting the marks you have done. You select the good ones and you discard the bad ones. And so it's a way of going forth, a very interesting process. It's not so straight as we tend to think. Yeah, I've done some work into trying to understand this process. It seems it resembles a lot the way in which you do a sculpture. You have a rock and you don't have a way to know exactly how much you have to take out or how much you have to make into the rock, right? It's a process that after every stroke that you do, you have to reevaluate the process and then keep going. And when I look at sketches that have been done by me or by other people, mainly by me because it's the only way that I can think this way, I wouldn't be able to do that again now. Sometimes I start sketching and I'm going to sketch this palm tree or something. And then I start adding detail to maybe the building behind it and the sky and, and other things. And it's a non-linear process. And unless you approach it in a super analytical way and try to look at it from a, like an abstract perspective and try to be really thoughtful of what you want to achieve. But at least for me, it's not the case. Many times I start adding detail that I didn't think of adding at the beginning or other sort of things. I don't know if this happens to you as well. Yeah, I think non-linear is a way of describing the process. Jan Berger wrote that it's like digging a tunnel in search of the light. So you don't know how it's going to turn out at the end, but you go on forth. It's like a struggle. Writing, and formally I would say self-publishing things online, on blogs and websites. I feel that the process for some of those essays or some of those posts is really similar. Sometimes you have a clear thought and you informally write as if you were writing an email to a friend and you just press send. You write maybe 500 words and you press send and that's what you publish. 
But other times, for me at least, I sketch out an idea, it's really rough. And then I spend hours and hours or maybe days or even months sometimes playing with the idea and getting to an end result. And at least for me, I haven't been formally trained as a writer or as a journalist or something. Uh, this process makes me get to unexpected results as well. Like places to say, oh, this now looks a lot better, but it's impossible from a 500 word essay or a thousand word essay to know how much care was put into it. It might be from 10 minutes to four months and we don't really know. A similar thing applies to sketching or any creative process that you follow. At the beginning, you put a great effort. The struggle I have just mentioned a big void in front of you, it's a blank space, you reflect, you make a reflection, then suddenly everything uh, makes sense and it's more mechanical uh, way, things go smoother. So it's, uh, you, go, you go into it at the beginning and then at some point you receive back the way of seeing that. So I like the world mechanical. Uh -huh. Because I was looping back to what you said before, I think the student who's taking notes with typing on the computer, that's a mechanical process. Like words enter your brain, your hands are typing, you're connected into a process and it doesn't require a lot of effort, as you said. The other process, which is you're writing by hand and there is an effort, there is like more like gasoline, right? Like every time you write, you're getting tired, your hand is getting tired. And uh, you have to measure how much effort you want to put and be more selective about the words. So I guess like that struggle of processing the words and selecting and then trying to summarize what is said, because you cannot type as fast, maybe write with your hand and typing. That process is what makes the effort allow you to remember things better. But yeah, I don't know. I, I just wanted to point out that mechanical thing that makes you forget about the process, like walking or running or something that doesn't require thinking. I think is what makes the disconnect from understanding instead of something that lets you process more things. I had in Spanish this expression you mentioned to me the other day is que mucho abarca poco aprieta. If you're like pushing into many areas at once, you can really push as hard as somebody else who's just pushing in one aspect of their professional career or creative field. And you were asking me, sometimes I wonder if I should give up on some of the things I'm doing. How do you manage to be content or be happy with the thought that, you know, you might not be progressing in one area as fast as you may in another because you're pushing too many things at once? And how do you manage to live with all these different disciplines? And I remember you also meant like they all feed into each other and that's something that you see as a positive thing. Yes, uh, that's the magic that happens. Of course, when things that apparently are not connected suddenly show a link between perhaps writing and reading and sketching, not your ordinary road, the usefulness of the useless. So you have a background with images, with texts that apparently are not related to each other, but suddenly there's like a spark and you connect things. So it's very enriching when you are not only focused on one task and you Apparently it's uh, like a waste of effort, but at the end, I think it's really worth the effort. What would be some of those things that you connect from one field to the other? And how do you define where the facet of a sketcher starts and the one of writer ends or as a teacher? For example, I'm going to take into account uh, something I read from a book written by Stephen Jay Gould, the paleontologist. An article about some fossils detected in a forgotten place in the British Columbia, in Canada. Very old, very ancient fossils that were uh, detected because of a flood. The way the first paleontologist that studied it, his background made him see what he was expecting to see. But they were not what he understood or described the first time. Why I'm saying this? Because apparently the way I study the old drawings of cities, it's a very similar process. And suddenly it made sense. I found a connection. It was a scientific writing that I was reading for fun. I found this connection between what a paleontologist study in these strange animals that were found in Iraq and the hints in the old drawings of cities. That kind of uh, way of seeing things that I was mentioning before. It's uh, connections you find among things. I might be wrong, but I think what you're referring to is something that I read about on Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. So this is a psychologist who got a, a Nobel Prize in economics. And he mentions this term that is called availability bias. 
Uh-huh. And availability bias means that your mind is always going to be triggered by the things that are available to it. So uh-huh. if you're trained as an architect and you look at drawings or even like some other concept, you're always going to look at it from that perspective. And uh, let's say that, you know, if you've been studying columns or designs or things like this, the first time you look at another drawing might be from a car or something, you know, your brain is going to fire up that knowledge. Oh, these vertical bars look like columns to me or something. I guess that acquiring knowledge from many different areas gives you a completely different perspective and, and your mind, the possibility of connecting into different points of it when you see new things, right? So that's why... I believe these things happen. It happens to me all the time. Like, well, I I just told you before the interview, when I was coming here, I looked at the label on a bus that was your street. And I would have never probably paid attention to that if I wasn't coming to have a talk with you, right? And so I I really like how those random connections happen. But in some way, I want to specify that they're not random. They are because of, you know, the things we consume, the things we've watched, the things we study. And maybe just to know if you do this, these serendipitous encounters can just happen. But do you make any effort in going to any events or reading anything specific or consuming any media sources that might improve or enhance this capability of relating different fields? I think the, the more open you are, the cleaner is your sight, your view. Discover uh, unexpected paths. Apparently, the first paleontologist, he didn't believe in evolution. So he saw what he could fit in his previous scheme of things. So it's obvious it's good if you have a wider background as possible. But you have also to be open to new things. So I think it's a balance between the both that makes things more productive. Can you comment on one of the projects that you've enjoyed the most? Perhaps those that have previous conditions that are very tight. This precise restriction makes uh, you think of a more creative way. I made this project. It's not a a big project. It's an architectural project in an existing old building, an old house. It was a two-house dwelling. It was a listed building and a small plot. I had to work with the dreams of the future dwellers that had some ideas. So it was a good way of not having complete freedom, but some strong conditions and requirements before that made you develop a new and more creative design, let's say. You know, we had in this podcast, we have Panagiotis Michalatos, which was my uh, master's thesis advisor. He's a, a like a Greek architect as well, but trained later as a computational designer and programmer. And he's a huge advocate of design constraints as enhancers of creativity or like something that helps you push the limits in a specific way. Like having too much freedom in some way blocks us. We have too many directions in which we can go, so we get blocked. But if you focus just into exploding one system, it really helps to move forward a lot better and generate better designs. I wanted to know also if you even thought of where you're today or if you had ever imagined where you would be today when you were studying architecture. In some sense, it's going back to the beginning. Because when I started to study architecture, I was thinking of productive terms, of useful uh, future developments of my career. And some of the things I left aside, like writing, studying, researching, Now I'm going back to them again. So I don't know if it's an answer to your question. You know, you now formally have the title of an architect, right? Like you're an architect and you even have a doctorate and you're starting now to to teach at university. And I believe you've done that before. How do you go about defining yourself as a writer, as a book publisher, as a sketcher, right? Those are, I feel that those are things that we need social approval from, from the city or from other professionals to write down. You can say I'm an architect because I'm certified and maybe a writer because I'm publishing on the newspaper. You can maybe can talk more about that. But yeah, how do you go about defining yourself, the things that you just learned by hard work and effort? I'm grateful to the School of Architecture for the site that has given me. Because some people compare between engineers and architects, saying that an engineer is someone who makes a very deep view into a very particular thing. And architects are those people that have wider interests, but not so deep. 
So this combination between the humanistic approach rooted in culture and history and also a very uh, technical understanding of things, it's a very balanced way of both things that have helped me a lot in the way of writing. I don't particularly like the word artistic, but it might be the case. I have a quote here from what you said on previous conversations to me. And it says, more than an artist than does beautiful things, I think I'm someone who thinks about what is done. Yes, yes, because I'm not thinking in the beauty of the result. I am interested in the process. I am interested in the development of things and the way it makes me things crystal clear, as I said uh, before. One thing that I also wanted to talk about is that I got to meet you when sketching with this local urban sketchers group at, in Malaga, right? So I would like to talk a bit about how you started drawing, how you started sketching and, and how you brought this group of sketches to Malaga. First, maybe if we step back, maybe you can introduce our audience to what urban sketching is and what the urban sketchers group is. Urban sketching is literally uh, draw the city in a direct approach, sketching on site. But it also is a, a noun that describes a group that is settled worldwide that was born in the United States by Spanish journalists that started to uh, combine text and drawing. It was using the drawings in a narrative way. Perhaps it has to do with his job as a journalist, but apparently what has always existed which is sketching reality, but like a part of a process, perhaps to produce a painting afterwards. And these drawings that were made in the process were always kept in a drawer. And apparently now they become like a target in, not only targeting itself, but also that due to social media become like a phenomenon. It's a community, a community is perhaps the word uh, that is really enriching because you see the different approach that are made by people from different backgrounds and from different countries. Because you know that, for example, architects paying attention to very particular things like proportion and perspective. Watercolorists also have a very specific approach of blending colors, complementary colors, perhaps not paying so much attention to line. So when you mix all these different way of seeing things together, the result is really enriching. So I believe the person you mentioned before is Gabby Campanario in Washington. Do you know where he lives? I don't remember. I think it's in Washington, yeah, in Seattle. In Seattle. He, he does have a blog online. I've visited, but I've never met him in person. So how do you get introduced to this group and what people you got to know to then go and decide to form a group here in your hometown in Malaga? Well, I was teaching the university 12 years ago, and I was a teacher of garden and landscaping. So I was making a search in the internet regarding architectural drawing. And suddenly uh, I found like a whole world of images, wonderful images that were something surprising and new for me. What year was this? I think it was 2009. Yes, 2009, 12 years ago. And I discovered specifically drawings by two architects, Gerard Michel from Belgium and Florian Affelbach from Germany. Both belonged to this community that had been settled on the Flickr. And I started to interact with them to make comments and receive comments. And also I started to post my own sketches, but it was all an online approach and an online relationship. And at some point, I thought that perhaps there were more people in a big city like Malaga that might have the same interest. And I found another person that also belonged to the urban sketcher community. She was Cristina Urdiales, an engineer herself. So we started to make comments to each other. And at some point, we decided to meet and perhaps to settle a meeting to invite anyone who was interested, who might be interested. It was like the seed of the group. Yeah, and I personally remember going 2010 in Hibre Alfaro's uh, castle. And I, I don't know if that was the first time I went. And I, I think I met you and all the people that belong to the collective or the group here. But yeah, that was also time of my introduction to this sort of drawing. 
I think it happened at the same time while I was starting to study architecture and one of our teachers was uh, encouraging us to go every weekend walk in, in the streets and sketch different spots throughout the city, you know, in situ, in, in the place. And just to clarify, in case that's not super clear for people who are not familiar with urban sketching, there is the Urban Sketcher Manifesto, which is online and talks about the characteristic of an urban sketch to be done on site as you're looking at reality and not doing it from a picture. In your own creative endeavors, you can draw from pictures and nobody's going to judge you for it, but the urban sketcher community pays a lot of attention and doing things in the place. Yes, and for me it's an invaluable approach because when you see things through a picture, when you draw from a photograph, you are missing a lot in the process because it has already been selected. You are not submerged in the three-dimensional world. You are already seeing things through a window, which is the rectangular sheet of a paper, which is the photograph. When you are in the real world, you are in the three-dimensional space, so you have no limits. You're not perceiving all the things in, with the same intensity. You are paying attention to what's in, in your focus, but you're like a peripheral view of things that are not uh, your, of your main attention, but perhaps the secret is time. I think time is the word. People also tend to compare a drawing with a photograph. It's like a frozen piece of reality. And it's not, because while you are sketching, perhaps you are uh, investing an hour of your life, half an hour of your life, depending on how fast you are. And things change a lot, not only perhaps because of the movement of things, but also because you are perceiving sounds, smells, things that are not directly related to your sight, but at the end make the experience as a whole. So that's a really valuable thing. What would be some of the specific things that you would do differently if you're sketching a building on the street or if you're sketching it from a photo at home? It depends on the purpose of the drawing you are making. Perhaps if you are making an analytical description of the building, you are just focusing on proportion, on perspective. But if you are perceiving it in a more uh, open way, just to understand, like to see it, you see more things. You see how people interact with the place, how shades change. It's much more enriching. And I think one thing that is also fascinating is that many times we go to these meetings, which because of the pandemic and stuff have been a bit halted and have been postponed to get back at it. And we will we'll be slowly getting back at them. The cool thing is maybe 20 or 30 people go if, if there's an event that many people go. And then you see all the sketchbooks and you see all these different ways that people have to look at the same thing, so right, it's the very same building, the very same space, the very same, like, I don't know, square or river or something. And then how different the interpretations of each individual are. Definitely. And it's not also, we have said many times, it's not also the beauty of or the perfection of the drawings, because some of the perfect drawings are soulless. And you see people that are perhaps not so skillful in sketching, but have a very powerful way of relating things, of explaining things, of a very sharp eye into reality. So it's also a very interesting point regarding perhaps your background and your studies and your age, even your age. One thing I wanted to ask also, when did you start drawing and when did you start sketching? Because we all draw when we're young, then in architecture you get taught like a way of drawing that is an architectural way. And then later there is that sketching facet that is also architectural, but it's different. It's looser, as you said, like it's a loose or wiggly line. It doesn't need to be perfect. It's more the sketch than the final drawing. In my particular case, I have always drawn since I was a child, but I was not particularly keen on sketching from reality. I just invented things from my mind. And in my first year of studies, I was encouraged by my teachers to go outside and sketching and sketching, not always the buildings you had in the street, making just a separate sheet, but also to keep it like a journal, to keep a sketchbook in which every single drawing was there, but the whole collection of drawings 
have a higher value than the sum of each of them because it was like testimonial testimony like capturing like a journaling or keeping a log right keeping a record of a process of uh, a search so it's a way yeah the thing that you mentioned resembles a bit i mean this is keeping record of everything you've done there is also this uh, phenomenon that's called the, the cheerleader effect this is for people right would you see an individual person they might not appeal as like pretty or handsome But when you see like a group of people in turn, because they're all different and stuff, each of them individually look prettier or more handsome being in a group. So there is this thing that is appealing from seeing the sketchbook with all these neighboring sketches on the page. And it makes it more appealing than maybe even sketch individually. That's an effect that I'm mindful of. And it's what happens when you see us like pictures on Instagram, for instance, like a lot of sketches in a page and it's like all the little labels and all these things. Every individual piece appeals more to the viewer because of that composition or that the group that accompanies it. Cheerleader effect. I've never heard that. <laughs> I will definitely take it down. I also appreciate sketchbooks that make it impossible to take sheets out. So you keep also your failures, not only your successes. And it's a bit annoying at the beginning. At the end, uh, with time, you tend to appreciate and to learn from your mistakes. We keep forgetting about these things, but I, of course, I started sketching with pencil, then pen, then the erasing the pencil and then watercolor, things like this. And then at, at some point I gave up on the pencil. I believe like mainly you too, like unless you're doing some composition at the beginning that you want to make sure that this sketch is uh, fitting in this space. So you start like being more comfortable with that. Say, this is my sketchbook, but it doesn't need to be perfect. And with that relief of stress that you know that it doesn't have to be perfect, you're just going to put everything you do in there. I, I think there is something to it. There is something to it where you know that you're allowed to make mistakes in this sketchbook. Yes. There's also a thing that I value a lot, which is perhaps when you are sketching in this way, Uh, directly without previous uh, pencil you are missing precision you are missing perfection but you're gaining authenticity and it's more sincere uh, result so yeah you can overwork things finish things overworking them but the more i draw uh, the more i tend to value to draw less and to consider important what you do not draw more than what you draw Can you talk a bit more about this practice that you do and as I do as well and many other people that you do into carrying a sketchbook with you and capturing improvised moments? It has become my invaluable friend, my best friend, my little sketchbook that I always bring with me every day on a regular basis. Perhaps I just keep it in my pocket all day and never take it out or perhaps I have the opportunity to take it out and to make observations and to find moments to sketch and to observe. It's a very useful eye gymnastics. Not also eye, because it's a, a brain process. I think the eye is only the excuse. It's a, a way of understanding things, as I said at the beginning. Yeah, many times when I'm going out and I come back home and I've been bringing my backpack or something, I have this expression that is taking the sketchbook for a walk, which uh -huh. means I took it just in case, but that day I didn't get to sketch. So this happens all the time because you want to make sure that you have it just in case you find those dead minutes or maybe that hour or something where you have an opportunity to portray something or capture something in that improvised way. And the effort to bring it, even if you're not going to sketch, is not as bad as the feeling that you get is like, ah, oh, I'm here in this train stuck for three hours and I could have sketched this figure that is here or these people that are in front of me yeah it's really frustrating when you find the moment or the opportunity to make a sketch and you don't have the sketchbook with you it's really frustrating i think the secret is to give a way to the opportunities so instead for example of driving to some place take a public transport it's a, a very healthy thing for your mind because it makes you aware of what is surrounding you, the people, the real people, the people who wouldn't coincide with you if you didn't walk or take uh, the bus or the train. I believe that now you're really comfortable like sketching anywhere and like standing on the street or sitting at a bar or, or any place. 
but this hasn't always been like this. Some people feel that, you know, the traits that you get as an experience sketcher are something that you always had. So for maybe young people or people who are getting started, what would you recommend? And can you comment a bit on like the first time you went sketching? How did you feel? Yes, when I was uh, at the university, we were to gathering groups. So you felt more protected because you were not uh, alone. So you were with your mates from the school. And also when you were traveling and you just bring your sketchbook with you in a different place where you don't know anyone. But it's different the first time you go out in your own city and you stand in a public place where you can be recognized by someone. The first day is a bit embarrassing. The second day you are not aware, you just relax and you are focused on your task and you forget it's an exercise, a way of meditation. So you just don't bother if somebody sees you. On the other hand, people tend to be very respectful and friendly. So it makes no sense to be embarrassed by that. Yeah, and people who pay attention are usually people who like the drawing or would like to do it or appreciate what you're doing. Where was the first place that you went sketching? I believe you told me 12 years ago. The first time I went in my own city to sketch, it was Plaza de la Marina, which is a very busy place where perhaps a half of the inhabitants of the city drive through so it's a big uh, possibility that you are being sighted and do you have any place in mind that you would go if you could catch a flight now and go sketching i tend to prefer not uh, very big cities just middle-sized cities which are not specifically touristic and they don't have to be very beautiful they just must provide a nice setting but with plenty of life it's like a way of authenticity, I would say. It's a word. There's a place I would uh, definitely love to know, which is Iran, which I find very appealing because of the history and the art. So perhaps, yeah, I would definitely yeah. go to Isfahan. I would <laughs> love to learn about the city through your sketches when you do. Who has been somebody that you consider influential on the way that you sketch? On the way that I sketch? For the way I draw which is making marks and not a very direct uh, way of making different proofs and refining the result. I like a lot uh, the work of the German engravers because the way they put the marks, I love this way uh, which is very expressive and the same way is, is very uh, precise and, and complex. But at the end, it looks simple. I like when things don't look complicated even though they might be, but they look simple. Yeah, I tend to look at these type of drawings, also etchings and engravings, and it's weird because it seems like really careful and you can look with a magnifier and see through each stroke. But if you try to mimic that carefully, it doesn't look the same. The strokes need to be really, really fast, really concise. And it seems, at least to me, that's obtained uh, through like years and years of practice of the technique. And I always think if these engravings go to our days, they probably were some of the best ones, right? There might be a lot of other people who made other engravings, let's say, not worth sharing with the world or something like that. The technique, let's say, looks really simple, as you said, but mm -hmm. if you try to do it, it requires a lot of training and a lot of practice. In general, if you look at your entire career, are there any other people who are influential that you look up as a reference or that left a mark on you? Not necessarily for sketching, but for writing, architecture, like the way you understand the world? Well, I really cherish the times at the university because there was times of endless conversations with your friends in your apartment when you had no particular uh, timetable apart from the lectures. So the way you talked freely, you started to define your way of thinking of things and confronting it to others with similar interest to your ones. They were very productive because it was endless time. You could be hours talking and they were definitely like a highlight for my way of thinking. Would you highlight one specific aspect of sketching that you really enjoy? I will go again to Rafael Alberti, which is the dancing of the pen. The pen dancing on the paper, like when you make a calligraphy, you just don't think you're going to write an A or a B or a C. You just leave it loose. And sketching in that way is 
so free for me that I really appreciate it. I might be wrong, but isn't this a way of carrying a sketchbook with you uh, the way that Leonardo da Vinci, for example, understood it to learn about things and sketch things on the city? Yes. In particular, I think of anatomic drawings. It's a fantastic way of understanding and also expressing and presenting it to others. Also, Albrecht Dürer, the focus on very simple things like the herbs in the field or little animals. So even the not very striking aspects of reality are worth uh, a look and it might be surprising for you. You also mentioned that you have a defect, that is that you try to think things through too much before you release them or publish them or things like this, and that this in some way freezes you. What do you think about this? Do you see the work in progress is something that you don't want to show the world? Or are you trying to work on this? Is this something that has always happened? I don't know if, if there's also the Spanish saying in English, which is the best is not always the good, which is I perhaps tend to think that things are not mature enough. So perhaps I want to make a second thing. It's a contradiction with the spontaneous approach. I really appreciate it's a contradiction. But yes, sometimes I tend to think, oh, perhaps it's not mature yet. It happens also with writing more than with sketching. Perhaps I feel more comfortable or more uh, confident with sketching than with writing. And maybe you yourself and other people who see your drawings are more forgiving with the imperfections on the drawing that the imperfections in writing we're used to reading from newspapers or books or things that have gone through a series of editors sometimes and you can retype something but it would make no sense for an urban sketch to be redone over and over until it's perfect right but seeing a typo it's something that kind of hurts your eyes but seeing like a wiggly line or something that is not perfect might not be yeah i think they're two different mediums it's really hard and i can relate to that One thing that you mentioned uh, as well to me is deadlines. For example, for those of you who don't know this, Luis publishes a weekly column, the local newspaper, Diario Sur. And mm -hmm. I believe at La Opinion, I don't know if you're still doing that one. I've been doing it for seven years and a month ago I quit it. How did having a, a tight deadline change your process? Because At least for me, you know, if you're just to publish a post or like some written text, if it's open-ended, it can be, as I mentioned before, years until I get it to something I want to publish. I might leave it aside for many months. Uh, how do deadlines change the way that you look at this process and the publication process and your creative process? Yeah, I think you understand also because you are also a creator. And for me, it's been a very useful exercise and gymnastics because it's not only the deadline, but also the extent. You have to be very tight to these 24 lines. You cannot make 23 or 25. You have 24 lines and to finish it the Friday at noon. So it's a way of not dispersing your efforts and to be concise. And I think regarding that, in some way, you know, sometimes you might say, ah, oh, this text needs to be like three lines longer, but I cannot make it. Or I wish I had one more month. But at the same time, that deadline, that limitation makes you more capable of creating because, you know, okay, I've complied with the line length. So I know this is okay, at least in the format. And I have to submit this no matter what. So it could be better. I could spend years working on it, but I have to, to take it out the door. I always remember the words of Seth Godin. This is like an American uh, writer. He's got like 25 books or something. And he talks mainly about marketing, but he also talks a lot about the creative process and how if you publish recurrently, like every day he publishes a blog post, for instance, you do one weekly. I'm starting to publish also weekly. You start giving less importance to each individual artifact that you produce, like each text, each sketch, and each, I don't know, like class that you give. As you repeat this process over and over again, it's more, as you mentioned, about the sketchbook itself and mm -hmm. not the individual contribution of one drawing and about your overall contribution throughout the years to the newspaper and not the individual essay that you're going to submit this Friday at noon. Yeah, it's also interesting when you have different registers. 
because I produce my weekly article, my weekly opinion column. I also write a research article for scientific magazines, and scientific journals. So they are very different the way you have to approach each of them. I particularly tend to be uh, poetic because I think the power of the myth and the symbols, when you are explaining things or you are relating something, when you put a metaphor in your text, I think it's really powerful and useful, but that's something you cannot do that much in research texts. You have to be precise, you have to be concise, you cannot make long sentences, so it's good to change suddenly from one text to the other uh, gender, so it's good, yes. You've mentioned to me that you need to be able to jump between these different registers. You mentioned the academic, the poetic, the opinion one, and mentioned that like in academic style, everything's a bit clear, it's a bit easier. In poetic style and opinion, it's a bit harder. And that your best point of reference was that you're a good reader. Yes, and I try not to read always in the same kind of books. I enjoy a lot, find very interesting for me scientific divulgation. I like also poetry, classic poetry and classic novels. I think that the blending of all those together is the most satisfactory way of reading. Can you talk about your writing process? Is there anything special about it or any series of steps that you follow to do it? I always like to start with citations of other authors that make me build some reasoning. I also, when I'm writing like an opinion column for a newspaper, ironics is always respectful, but ironics is also a good point. Not to make everything harder, introducing a bit of humor is the way of softening things, not to be aggressive. We talked about this before in the terms of sketching and, and writing, but Is your process linear or how do you allocate what publication you want to do for this Friday as opposed to next week or the other? Do you have a repository of ideas that you build on top of or is it perfectly scheduled? Sometimes I tend to think that I'm always writing the same thing. At least it's something I perceive. People that read me say it's not the point. It's not always the same at all. But you tend to think that you repeat the same ideas. When I'm writing something, I like to put the strong ideas, like three strong ideas, and then I blend them, making connections between them, not to make a sharp cut between them. Is there a moment, for instance, where you have a draft, so an idea that you're working on and you say, okay, this is harder, I require more time for this, I'm going to leave this aside, so I'm going to write on something completely new from scratch for this week, I'll submit it and then I'll focus on that other idea for a different week. Do you have the time and the option to do that? Sometimes uh, you are reaching dangerously the Friday and then you suddenly realize that you have no ideas. Other times, the reality, perhaps the news, help you a lot because there's some big issue that is going on, mainly on urbanism or urban planning. That is my field of interest. But sometimes you become poetic when you are seven years writing weekly. Perhaps some point you write about memories, about time. I think time is a subject that is always floating around me. Memories, the meaning of life, perhaps, so things like that. To answer in a more accurate way, I think my background as an architect helps me a lot because I perceive things in a modular way and to structure, to build things with a structure is important even if it's subtle and it's not uh, directly perceived. According to what you said before that you feel that like you're writing all the time about the same thing, I had the same feeling I've heard other writers talk about the very same thing. I remember this quote from John Maida. He's a researcher at MIT and, and a, like a big creative. And it says repetition, it works. And the meaning behind it is that we think that we're repeating things and probably we are, but that works because people don't understand them at first. 
And even if they're listening to you, the fact that you're repeating something over and over and over is going to let them process or digest those ideas better. And then the second part of this is that we tend to think that everyone's listening all the time. So if we say, let's talk about time today, let's talk about time tomorrow, they're going to be bored. But uh, there are different nuances that we introduce every time we talk about the same thing. And also, it might be the first time that somebody reads something that you've done, or it might be somebody who's been disconnected from your writing for months, and then suddenly they find that text. So uh, I feel that we can always bring this opportunity to people to read about the very same thing that we wrote a year ago. And it's unlikely that everyone is going to make that connection of, oh, it's talking about the very same thing or I already know about this. So I don't know. I like to think that way because it's true that there is like always like this thread of topics that we tend to repeat over and over. And, you know, that's who we are and that's what we are interested in. Yeah, and, and it's true too that perhaps you're saying the same thing, but in a different way. You're expressing in a more informal way because it's also true that people tend to perceive things according to their schemes, like when we were talking about the fossils and the interpretation of fossils, that people tend to read, not what you're saying, but what they are expecting you to say. So if you turn the things in a different way and present them with another aspect, it's a good way of making a better connection between you and the reader. I also have a short publication that talks about time. And somebody might tell you, oh, I really like this little story where you were talking about your watch or about the Egyptians or something. And I don't remember, I say, which one are you, are you referring to? And then I think, oh, I was actually writing about time. There is like a different way of seeing. So the reader has to interpret and they many times focus on aspects of the writing that you didn't think were that important or would be what sticks. And I guess that's also something that comes with being a more experienced writing that you can imagine farther what will stay on the mind of the reader, right? Yeah, even articles that you think that they didn't result particularly successful, you didn't quite express all the things you wanted to express and tend to be not really proud of what you wrote. But people really liked it. They find it appealing. So it's like a mystery. It's similar to what happens with what's called search engine optimization, where you're trying to make something so people get to it by typing things on Google. And it's really random. Like many times you write about something that is super meaningless, took you two minutes, and then you start getting like thousands of visits because everyone now has that question and is looking for that. And then maybe you put years into writing a, a piece of text and then nobody enters, right? It's about attention and, and what people are like a called by. One thing that I uh, wanted to also ask you is about publication. How did you get to publish your first book? Is it easier now? Was the process really hard? How did that happen? My first book was really more than an accident because it was not done on purpose. The thing is, my wife encouraged me to publish my collection of drawings. I had a big collection of drawings. As I said before, uh, they were in a sketchbook, so they were an organized collection of drawings. So she said, why don't you publish them? I said, well, it's my drawings. But apparently more people asked for that in uh, the internet. I had some suggestions. So I, I said, okay, let's try to find a publisher, which was not easy because it was a, like a very local product. It was my sketches of my own city. The variety of uh, publishers present in Malaga was not that wide. So I had a doubt of who would understand these kind of things that had not been already done here. And I found this wonderful publisher that was focused on books for children. He really understood because he was a graphic designer himself. So he was understanding the visual very well. It was very authentic because they were a collection of drawings done without the purpose of being published. So uh, it was like making them organized in a way that made some narrative sense for my surprise and for the publishers. Uh, surprise, it was really successful. We have five editions already. 
and it's still selling uh, well uh, from 2014 that came the first edition. So Loving Books is the name of the publisher, yeah, right? The publisher Alejandro Villén and Maria Corredera, which are uh, the two names after uh, Loving Books which is the, the brand. Yeah, I love some of the publications, yours and from some other people that I've seen that they've published, that they're really nice. You know, how does exhibiting your work, selling your work, you might be selling some sketches, exhibiting your sketches, also selling books that feature your work. How does that feel? It's a bit strange because the first thing you asked was, what are you trying to convey? And I'm not really trying to convey, so it's also a bit embarrassing because even though you think that you are not expressing much about yourself, you are telling a lot about you. The things that are important to you, it's like a bit feeling naked. One of the things that Yuval Noah Harari, that is the writer of Sapiens, this uh -huh. book that it's like a non-fiction like essays. Yes. And uh, one of the things that he mentions that uh, the main difference from humans to other species is that we like to gossip, right? We like to talk about things that are meaningless in some way and that have to do with mundane things that happen to us and mainly to our colleagues or to our friends or to our community. In some way, I think what attracts readers and the audience and, and other people around the world is that the hope that you will get to know something special about the person who's conveying those things. Uh, so when pieces are, sometimes there is this thing where some people that teach how to write and things say, say to you, not everything that has happened to you in your life is something that people are going to care about. That's something that when you start writing personal things, we tend to think, oh, let's describe everything, right? It's not about that. But I do think that there is a lot of power and I try to do that in my own work with presenting yourself in an authentic way and uh, being open that, you know, we're human, we're not robots and we don't have to appear perfect beings. I think that happens a lot. That's the concept of wabi-sabi. I don't know if that is like kind of the concept of being comfortable uh, with things that are imperfect. To me, that's a process that took like almost, I would say, eight or 10 years to get to. That is being content with putting things out there. People might judge because they're not perfect, they're not finished and that your way of thinking will change over time, right? It's an opening process, but uh, also about saying, this is what I do, this is what I'm trying to learn and what I'm trying to do, and this is all my process. I think there is a lot to that, and people can definitely uh, appreciate that process. I'm not really trying to teach something, it's just expressing ideas in a very humble way. I remember having an argument in the internet with someone who said, uh, you, the architects, have to... I'm not uh, talking in behalf of uh, the architects, I'm just expressing my own ideas and I might be wrong, I'm probably wrong in many ways, but I think the enriching thing is when you vibrate in the same way of other ones. Uh, when you read something that perhaps has not been for you, but even if you read, for example, the Quixote, and the fragility of the Quixote, you feel it in your own way, your ideals, perhaps outdated, and that kind of vibration you feel with the one who wrote it, it's very uh, appealing. And I think it's the secret of communication. Do you have in mind the publication of yours, book or blog post that has been the most successful, that has touched the most people or that people have congratulated you the most or that has sold the most copies? This book, it's a kind of biographical approach to my city, which is a Malaga sketchbook published by Loving Books. It is a very personal way of receiving my city. Many people feel recognized in it. I think it's the secret of why it's been so widely distributed. Also, articles, opinion columns I have written about the city, not in a nostalgic way, because it can be also confused with nostalgia, but articles that I have dedicated to the city as a harmonious place for living where you can be in touch with others are also very widely appreciated by readers. Tying into this uh, publication realm of yours of like putting things out there for people to read, to see, to watch, I would ask you, how does it feel to have a new website? Oh, well, as you know, I have many interests. My presence in the internet was very chaotic, you know, because you are the person who designed and developed the website. I feel very proud of how you did it. 
because it's the way I appreciate things, also in architecture. Things that appear to be very clean, very simple, although had a lot of work, of organization, complexity that is not obvious. I'm really happy to have my drawings, my scientific production, my books, my journalist work together. What's changed after you have been in some way enabled to publish in a different form? Have you found yourself crafting your content online in a different way or sharing it with peers in a different way? The most obvious is that some people know me because of my drawings. Some people know me because of my presence in the newspapers. Some people know my academic research. Having all in the same uh, place make uh, clearer what my profile is. I'm not also a person who makes drawings or who writes. It's hard to describe oneself when you do many things. It's not just Louis Reed the architect. It's like a lot of other stuff. You needed a bio. You needed like a one page biography to explain what are your interests and the things that you do. Perhaps you remember that my last thing to be ready for the website was the presentation page where you define yourself. It's uh, apparently the, the easiest thing because you just put down what you are, but not so easy. What's interesting about that is that we had, again, talking about constraints, we had like an open-ended biography page. For those of you who are listening or are watching, I would say you can go to the website at luisreith.es. That's a Spanish domain name, so luisreith.es. I believe you can also just Google Luis Reith Padron or Luis Reith. Uh -huh. And uh, what was interesting is that we had this open-ended biography page in the about page, and uh, you didn't really have any constraints. You can add as much as you want there. But then we said, okay, now we need a summary of this. We need something to put like a headline with one, two or three sentences on the main page that uh, people will be willing to write. Because, you know, when you see a bio that is long, some people just skim through it. And that summarizes all the things that you do, which is hard. And this is also on the website. This is something that is ever changing because as year pass, you might start doing new things or you might uh, stop doing certain things. And this is something I've seen myself and other people. The bio is some of the things that changes the most because you think you're like a designer who writes, but then three years later, you're a podcaster or a publisher or uh, you've started teaching, right? There is that kind of dynamic nature of describing oneself. And it is more apparent when you have to put it in words. Okay, now you have a website, you have to put that headline there. Who are you? I introduced you at the beginning. Can we do this exercise where you try like maybe to summarize who you are to the audience? There's a Spanish saying that is hombre orquesta. I don't know if you have that word in English. <laughs> that is someone who plays a lot of instruments himself. You have uh, many faces. But I define myself as an architect, not only because it's the title I was given at the university, but also the way I see things and organize my mind. So... Perhaps the words you use the most accurate an architect who teaches, who writes, and who sketches. And also, of course, construct buildings. Okay, before we move in to something that is a bit more about life in general and we start wrapping up, I would love to... Well, I already mentioned your website, so luisreith.es. Where else would you point people if they want to see more of your work? If they go to the website which I am very grateful again, because I'm very satisfied with it. There you have the different paths. Twitter, where I publish some opinions. Facebook, which is more a general approach. And the Instagram, where are my images. Luis also has some links to the newspaper publications that they can see and then they can get linked to there. And actually we'll add notes to the show notes of this podcast as well with some of these links. As a follow up to this, I would like to know when did you start teaching, right? This is something that you've been learning a lot, studied architecture, or sketching, writing. Why did you start teaching? Teaching is a way of learning for me because apparently you are the one who is teaching, but it's you who is learning. For me, it's a really productive way of learning. To be precise, it was 2004. I started to teach landscaping and gardening in the private school of architecture in Malaga. I was there for seven years, I think. Then I focused on other things. I was not a full-time teacher, just giving lectures and 
conferences. Now I'm back at the university, 10 years later, teaching at the School of Architecture, the subject of architectural graphic expression and the touch with students, the way you see their curiosity is something that has no price for me. When I have spent four hours all through the afternoon and we finish, the feeling I have is like floating in the air. The one thing that we haven't talked about is that throughout this worldwide organization of urban sketches, Luis also teaches workshops that have to do with sketching and you go to maybe given some lectures, some conferences. I wanted to ask you, what is the hardest or what are the hardest things that maybe your students or your workshop attendees uh, have to learn or struggle to understand? Again, it's to be relieved from what you see with your mind. Trusting your eyes. What I say to people is trust your eyes and not what you have in mind. Be free, have a clean look into things so that they don't condition your sight, your perception of things. And is there any advice that you would like to give young people or just people who are trying to learn how to write, sketch or teach or any of the things you do? Don't be afraid of making mistakes because making mistakes is the way of learning. If you don't make mistakes, you don't learn. In short, it's my main advice. What would be some of the biggest mistakes that you've learned from? Overdoing things, not trusting my eyes, as, as I said, mainly with writing, not expressing the things in the more direct. Trying to be baroque, uh, it's a mistake. Be more straightforward, right? Something that you could maybe tell people to do, right? Use simple words and something that is clear. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, you know, we've talked about a lot of your creative endeavors. I was inherently attracted and interested by the way that you teach, you sketch, you write and publish your contents. I would like to now move into something that has to do more with, like, how does Luis Ruiz understand life as a whole? And the first question for me is, do you consider your life simple? I try every day to make it simpler. I borrow from you, getting simple is a motto in my life. Yeah, definitely. The more time passes, the more clear I see things in that sense. And can you think of one thing that would make your life uh, slightly easier? Not trying to satisfy others, to keep to someone's opinion of you, what they expect from you, but just to be honest with yourself and with the others. Being honest with you is being honest with the others. You know, following up on this that you just said, you're on social media, as you've mentioned. How does your presence online and gathering the feedback that you get from the things that you put online, how does it transform your work? There's a risk of your way of making a research, a path of looking for something is not what people appreciate. So sometimes you are tempted to produce things in order to satisfy your followers. Some people say that my line is becoming more free and it's losing straightness. Sometimes you feel, okay, they don't like it. <laughs> but uh, you cannot restrain yourself from your own way of being. That sounds like when longtime fans go listen to Bob Dylan. He's like been singing the same songs for so many times that now he's kind of changed the way he does and it doesn't sound like the albums. Uh -huh. So they complain, like, I cannot understand what he's saying. But, you know, in some part, I think that's part of your work line, right? And uh, it would be silly to get fixed into what style that you had at the beginning, because this is like a continuous evolution. What is your relationship with technology and digital technologies? I don't know if you even had computers when you started starting architecture. Today, everything's a bit different. Uh, let me say that my father died 22 years ago. And I think if he saw me today, he would be really surprised to see me managing computers and internet and social media. Because I, in some sense, we have talked about handwriting and hand sketching, the importance of uh, taking time into things. It's like a contradiction. You cannot be close to advances and progress, but you have to be aware what is progress and what is not. What piece of technology, like a program, something you have on your phone, your computer, can you think of a piece of software that makes your life a bit easier? 
the possibility of being in contact with someone at the other side of the world just in, in this strict moment for me it's a miracle it's crazy yeah and thinking more in creative terms something that is maybe a tool that you use i don't know for anything that has to do with your creative endeavors in that sense i'm a bit old-fashioned so i try to make things by hand and once they are composed by hand for example i don't use digital drawing i'm a bit old-fashioned One question that I tend to ask all my guests is if you could send a message to the world, what would that be? Don't run. Take the time to be aware of where you are and where you're going. Don't just be pushed in some direction. Just to find like a gap, uh, like a piece of time for yourself and try to locate where you are and where you're heading for. Don't let the day by day pushing yourself in some direction that perhaps you are not interested in. I have a quote here from you that says, do what satisfies you and what you think that could help others. Yes, helping others. We are a social animal. So it's incredible when you perceive a smile directed at you by perhaps someone at a store or something. It can change your whole afternoon. Perhaps if you do it more frequently, it's a good way of acting. It's a way also of making yourself more honest and more direct to the others. Is there anything that makes it easier for you now to do the work that you do as a creative, like the sketches or publishing books or uh, writing things or connections that you didn't have before that you wished you had found earlier? I think things have to mature. I think the more you study, the more you work. The quote by Picasso is very famous. Inspiration exists, but it has to find you working. So I don't think that the time you wasted is a wasted time. It's an investment you have made. What would you do if you didn't really need money, right? If we didn't need money to live, what would you do differently? Time, yeah. Time uh, to do more things in a more relaxed way. Yeah, I think time is uh, the important And in contrast, what things do you do that maybe you wouldn't do if you had the money? What things are you doing because you need to obtain money in some way that you wouldn't like to do if you didn't need to? Yeah, even the most rewarding activity like uh, sketching or drawing, when you do it on purpose for others, when it's going to be published in a newspaper, you have to take into account who is going to see it. It's not always for yourself, a self-document, it's something which is going to be for others. You have to consider some restrictions in, in some sense. So it's not for yourself. Are you comfortable with solitude and boredom? Yes, I need it. For me, uh, have some spaces of silence is very important to recalibrate your brain and to let the ideas settle. I need the others for me. Is being with my family and friends is really the essence of life, but without those spaces, I couldn't live. Is there any time that you think about death? Yes, very frequently. In fact, thinking about time, as we said, is about thinking of birth and death. Not only with people, but with history, with time. Yeah, uh, and, and I think it's a great subject of literature and art. How do you think thinking about death and life and birth and, and time inform uh, what you do, not only creatively, but on your day to day? It gives the real importance about yourself and about you know, what you do. So it's not really important at all. If you see the tiny dot we are in the middle of the universe, it makes you feel more relaxed about what you do and what you are. It makes the typo and the wiggly line like meaningless, right? Yeah, yeah. It's not something to be scared of. It's just put things in precise terms. What do you think that distracts you, that grabs you away from being able to maybe spend quality time with your family or spend quality time writing or doing what you like doing? Social media is a terrible, it's a very useful tool that has helped me reaching places I would have never dreamt of. But when you use the same thing 
for work and for destruction. Yeah, it's a really dangerous tool. I see it with my kids that now, even though they have reached a very late uh, age for what is common today, I see now how they perceive things, they study, and it's hard for them to focus on tasks. It happens to me too, so I understand what is going on. It does happen to me too. <laughs> <laughs> and what techniques or what things do you do to disconnect, to maybe claim those moments of solitude of maybe boredom or just time to yourself? Walk, like taking a stroll through the city, just leaving yourself get lost with not a particular path. So perhaps you tend to go always in the same direction by the same street, try a different street this time. And yeah, just look around and try to get what you see, listen to conversations, people that you don't know at all. So it's a very good way for me doing that. Uh, you know, you talked about looking at the city as a place where we can all coexist. And I'm curious, in your daily routine, what role does the city play? And also a bit unrelated, but as a follow up, what process do you follow for note taking? Do you do any daily journaling or do you take notes of your own experiences? For me, the city is still the best invention made by the human being. Today, uh, city is perceived like in a negative factor for humanity, full of dangers and bad things. I completely disagree with that approach. I think perhaps it's kind of urban settlement that has nothing to do with cities. Cities is a place where you are interact with others in a non-planned way. We have lots of compartments, and when you go out in the street, you just blend with the others and the unexpected might happen. I like to have no plans in that sense. I like to go to shops and I like talking to my grocer and baker. It's a very good way of keeping track of the real life. Listening to the things they talk about, it's very useful. And you receive back also a smile which is we have to smile more and we need more smiles received. And the other question was, is there any routine that you have for note taking, maybe taking notes or journaling about your day or, as you said before, the sketching as a way to keep a record of your days? At some point, I, I made up uh, some idea, which is hunting or uh, fishing ideas. Hunting is you go with a plan to discover things. I prefer fishing, acting as a fisherman. You just throw the net, something will come up. I think it's more the way of I do things. Not uh, to have a plan, but just let things come to you. So perhaps I don't have a really articled way of organizing things. Uh, and I think that the unstructured nature of that process where you're not... I mean, some people don't work that way, right? Some people apparently from the outside, at least as we can see them, plan ahead for months or for weeks or something and say like, okay... This week is going to be this post, this book for next year, this thing. But at least it doesn't work for me. I don't know. I cannot do that. So yeah, I really like the analogy of hunting versus fishing. I am envious of those people that can plan. It's just I'm not capable of that. Sometimes I think it's more the perception. Some people know how to plan and really well, but for other people might be just the perception from the outside. Like some people might perceive that you have a tight schedule every week and you're publishing mm -hmm. and uh, it just gets to know a person to know that the process might not be what we imagined. The last question in this round would be, how do you define success? Yeah, I consider myself as a very ambitious person, but some people consider me not ambitious at all. Because my ambition is in the uh, intellectual side. So I uh, consider productive activities, learning and discovering things, being curious about things. So to have the chance of being curious and making research on things is for me the success. To have time to, to do that things, that kind of activity. Before we start wrapping up, I know that you brought some sketchbooks and I wanted to ask you for maybe urban sketchers or people who write, what are your tools? The brand of your pens or what watercolor brass you use or what sketchbook? What's your go-to gear for sketching today? Again, my motto is borrowed from you. Keep it simple. Get it simple. The lighter 
you go, the better. Because it's not like producing wonderful images, very complex. Just grabbing the reality and putting it in the paper. So for me, it's just a sketchbook, a pen, and a portable watercolor set. And could you, for maybe if there's any urban sketcher that's listening, what brands do you like? I know that I use the Micron and some Pentel brass. Wh which ones do you use? Regarding the sketchbook, I like these little uh, sketchbooks, very small ones by, um, uh, what's the Italians? Also the Dean A5 size, it's Hanne Müller. It's very common for me using them. I like the touch and the feeling of the paper. Still and Burn, also a brand I... And not a very particular brand, because it's more handmade. Accordion Concertina sketchbooks. For me, it's a very good way of narrating things and blending the little details with wider panoramas. What about pens and brushes? Yeah, for pens, I use Micron pens, which for me is very useful. They are permanent, so you can put the wash afterwards. And um, these uh, Russian watercolor sets, White Knight, I like them. I think that they have a, a beautiful relation between quality and price, and they have very vivid colors, which I like a lot. Yeah, and the Sakura Micron pens have archival ink. That means that they won't fade away with time. And do you write by hand as well? For my articles, uh, daily articles, I, I type. But when I am thinking, when I'm not producing something specific, just grabbing things and putting them on the paper before they vanish, uh, I like handwriting. I'm making not only handwriting, but making schemes and notes I even have one sketchbook by my bed. Perhaps I wake up in the night as perhaps you come up with something you have dreamt and say, okay, I'm going to forget this if I not take it down right now. But yeah, I handwrite in those uh, terms. What is next for Luis Ruiz? What can we see next from you? Now, at this point, I am very passionate with teaching at the university. I think it's uh, like a new world opening with many different branches. Production of academic articles, perception of the city through sketching and drawing is a new path. I would also like to those seven years of writing, which are dispersed articles and texts, perhaps putting them in a more comprehensive way, getting them together in a book with some structure. I'm envious of the students that you have because I studied at the same school and it would have been <laughs> awesome to have you as a teacher. And, you know, we didn't talk about your thesis, but can you briefly comment on what it is in case of people are interested? Yeah, my thesis, which deals of the drawings made from my city, from the image of my city since the Middle Ages, To when photography came up. It's the investigation of how this image has evolved, but also how it has been perceived by people. We architects like a lot to study the plans and maps of the cities, and not so much the sketches, three-dimensional sketches, because they are very subjective. They are not objective, and they are not uh, reliable, because you cannot measure on them. But they provide really, really interesting information. When you sketch, you understand what other sketches did. You understand what decisions they made, where they cheated. But they cheated to tell the truth. It's another contradiction. But sometimes you have to make a bit of cheating to be honest. And it's something you, as a sketcher, will understand perfectly. Yeah, you gotta <laughs> deform reality to make it more real. So it's like summoning the whole collection of drawings and putting them in context. It's what I did in my thesis. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Last thing before we wrap up, I will ask you if there's anything that you want to ask me. I would like to ask you how an architect like you have evolved to this kind of very interesting and enriching things you are doing that perhaps are not so related, apparently, to architecture? That's going to be my question for you. <laughs> A good one. 
Actually, something that is interesting is that even before I knew I was going to study architecture, I had already started tinkering with computers. In this house that we're recording here, behind there, there was one of our first desktop computers, and I would spend many, many hours with them. I actually remember I happened to buy uh, like magazines with computers, and they brought even like a test software for editing images, like the processors of Photoshop or something like that. Let's say I got into computers before I got into architecture completely, and I started programming. There is like an interesting turn there when I realized that by designing things on the computer and programming and putting things online, I think it was 2003 or 2002 or something, there was money that, that was coming into your bank, right? Like advertising money and money for people who wanted to sign up for things and all this sort of stuff. So I got hooked by the internet even before growing up and studying. And uh, this played into my advantage while I was in architecture because I was really acquainted with the digital medium. I was really quick at catching up AutoCAD and other programs and 3ds Max to the renderings. And this persisted throughout my career. I put a lot of effort into architecture, but every opportunity I had, I would do some programming or some design or some 3D stuff that could complement the design projects that I was doing. And in fact, the first application that I put out there in the world was an iPhone app that had to do with um, bending moments. It was a really simple one. It's there. It's called Force. It's still on the App Store. So this was really in 2012. It was like a lot later. But it also, people would pay for it. Some people would see that it was useful. Other people said it was crap. <laughs> and, you know, I was fine with that. It wasn't unless I went to a workshop where they introduced me to parametric design, that is like using computation to design things for architecture and engineering, uh, that I managed to merge those fields. I mean, there, there was like some other places in between, but I ended up getting specialized at Harvard GSD in Boston in this field, learned more programming, and then I decided that my experience being an architectural designer had kind of ended and I was going to focus more in programming and all that stuff. So I turned into programming and I also ended up doing a lot of trying to optimize processes. So mm -hmm. I got hooked by trying to optimize things inside of architecture, inside of how to do things for design, how to write, how to publish online. This turned out into this that we're doing today. So podcasting, media, content, lecturing online to teach people and to learn, as you mentioned before. So learning myself. And, and yeah, I really enjoy it. I hope that this more and more uh, over my career is the main director of my work and creative life. And I really enjoy it. When I got into audio, one of my teachers told me I was starting to become like an audio engineer. So I'm trying to do all these things, but getting a bit detached from the production process and things like that. So yeah, I, I hope that answers your question, but I think it's really on spot because it's I really don't like when people call me an architect. We refer to this as being retired architects. You know, we were architects, but now we have a different point. But at the same time, I wouldn't change the fact of having studied architecture for anything else in the world. Even though I didn't learn like full computer science or other disciplines, I think we learned things like marketing or like idea generation, idea execution, the ability to focus on something you want to get out the door. So yeah, I think it's really valuable. So even if you don't want to be an architect, it might make sense to study architecture to be a marketer or a businessman or I don't know, many other things. I think this way, I don't know if that's true, but as you can see, I mean, in this room, we have Luis that is an architect who writes and teaches and sketches and does other things. I'm doing many things and behind the camera we have uh, Daniel Natoli, which was on the podcast before as well. And he's filming these things and doing a lot of creative projects. I guess it, it happens in any field, but architecture is one of the ones because of the crisis that we've had with construction and the difficulties on uh, getting a job started. People are reinventing themselves and they find themselves on the market with such a powerful tool that is going from concept to idea to execution to production to selling it to people in a way that might be understandable and appealing. So yeah, I don't know. I think that is what defines me as well. Trying to get things are really hard in a way that is more digestible and hoping to simplify them in a way. So thanks for your question. And yeah, I want to wrap up this saying thank you to everyone who's been watching today. And if you stuck with us until the end, this was Luis Reed. It's been my pleasure to have you on the show. And I hope that we can talk in the future. Honor to be here today with you. Thank you. Thanks everyone for watching. We'll see you next time.